Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab that. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 31, and we're also going to look at Psalm 119. So if you want to go to Psalm 119 and hold your place, we'll look at a single verse there to back up something we're talking about. We're going to spend the rest of our time in Genesis 31, unless the Spirit leads us down another path. But uh, this is serving as part two of our study of Genesis chapter 31. And the reason we've broken it up into two parts is simply because of its length. Okay, Genesis 31, as you're noticing, is 55 verses, which would, been, would have been a lot to do in one session. And we are under no time constraint. We're taking our time walking through this to make sure we're really gleaning what we need to out of it. So uh, we decided to break it up into two parts. Let me go ahead and pause right here and say, if you've not yet seen video one, you absolutely need to see video one to get video two. Too, because we are going to be picking up during the midst of a conflict that we left it hanging on last week. And if you don't have all the setup for that, this is not going to make much sense. So I'll encourage you, go back and watch part one. It's right over there on our YouTube channel, and then you'll be ready to watch this. So what I'll go ahead and do is I will pray, and then I'll review uh, a little bit about what we talked about last week so that we're built up to what's happening here, and we'll jump in. So let's pray together. Holy God, we love you. And we are so thankful for your grace that you have lavished upon us, even though we do not deserve it. Father, I thank you for this group, for their commitment to your word. I pray, Lord, that we are uh, opening our hearts to receive the messages as you've revealed them to us. I pray that as our knowledge of you increases, our faith increases as well. Use this time. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So, last week we talked about Jacob wanting to leave uh uh, Laban's house. So Laban is his father-in-law. And up, up to this point, Laban has really uh, been kind of harsh toward Jacob. And by that, I mean, he's been deceiving him. Now, on one hand, that's kind of Jacob getting what's coming to him, because up to that point, Jacob had been a deceiver. But um, now Laban has been deceiving him, as we'll see. We'll see it again in this chapter, but last time it said that he had changed his wages like 10 different times, and uh, originally Jacob wanted to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel, and he said, in order to marry her, I will give you seven years of work. I'll work for you for seven years in exchange for marrying your daughter. Well, when the seven years were up and the time came for him to marry that daughter, Jake, uh, Laban gave his older daughter Leah to Jacob instead and asked Jacob to work another seven years for Rachel. So he ended up working 14 total years. So Laban has deceived Jacob quite a bit. And now that Jacob has fathered children with his wives and certainly with his wife's servants, um, the time has come to move on. Jacob has been made very prosperous. God has made him prosperous because remember, Jacob is the recipient of the covenant promises. God established a covenant with Abraham. Right, I'll bless you. You'll be a blessing to others. I'll make you into a great nation. Have descendants as numerous as the stars if you're faithful to me. Uh, that same covenant promise was made to Isaac. That now promise has been attributed to Jacob. So God is blessing Jacob. You can read back in chapter 28 to get all the details of that. Chapter 28 is where God really uh, reiterates the statement of the covenant to Jacob. And so uh, Jacob is now the recipient of these blessings. So he's been made very prosperous. He's got a big family, and now he wants to leave his uncle Laban's land. Well, when he does that, Laban says, well, what are your wages? What can I pay you? And you have to understand, Jacob was a little bit leery about hearing, what are your wages? Because the last time Laban asked him that, he ended up working for him for 14 years. So he says, all I want from you, Laban, I want to go through your herd. Laban had a sizable flock, quite wealthy himself. He says, I'm going to go through your flock, and I want to take every speckled, spotted, black, brown, all, all of the uh, multicolored sheep for myself. Well, that sounds a little strange, and honestly, that deal benefits Laban, because even in a large flock, the striped and spotted and speckled and black ones are going to be a very mi small minority. So Jacob was actually taking the smaller portion of the flock for himself, leaving the lion's share for his uncle. Well, God began to allow these speckled, spotted black sheep and goats to multiply and multiply and multiply so much that Laban's sons think that Jacob has stolen from their father. 
And so Jacob certainly didn't steal it. It's been God's blessing on him. But even still, Jacob leaves and Laban pursues Jacob for seven days and finally corners him and asks him, why have you taken all my things? And Jacob explains to him that he hasn't taken anything. It's a blessing from God. But the, uh, something else has happened. Rachel, which is Laban's daughter, Jacob's wife, took Laban's household gods. Now, uh, what are household gods? These were little like trinket things. You can kind of, this is a jar full of sweet notes from my wife, but you can picture it kind of like a little statue. And all of the detail about these gods can be found in the last video, but long story short, these were idols that could be found in the homes of ancient people and they would worship them. Sometimes it was false worship, right? Other times though, people said that this little idol in their house represented the God of the universe that we worship. And while I appreciate that they were wanting something to represent God, um, that's still idol worship. That is not the way God is meant to be worshiped. So in either case, having these household idols was, was not a great thing. And in, in some instances, uh, these things were quite ornate, right? They were worth a lot of money. The reason that Rachel takes these from her father is uh, I don't think it's to worship them herself. I heard one scholar say that uh, she took them because she had grown up in that house and was used to that kind of worship. And now that she knew she was leaving, she wanted to be able to worship in the way she'd grown up doing. I can appreciate that thought. I don't think that's right. These household idols were given as a gift to the principal heir. And Jacob was no longer going to be the principal heir because Laban had sons. So I think that Rachel took the idols from her father to solidify her husband's position as that principal heir. It could have been financial because they're, wor they're worth a lot of money, but Jacob is quite wealthy at this point. I doubt that she would have been wanting for anything and needed them for financial gain. In any event... Uh, Laban says, okay, well, I get, okay, God has blessed you. Why did you take my gods? And Jacob essentially says, no one has taken your gods. If you find them among anyone here, may they be put to death. Jacob has no idea his wife has been the one to take these. And that's where we pick up. Let me read for you here, Genesis 31, look at verse 32. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live. This is Jacob speaking to Laban. Uh, in the presence of your of our kinsmen, point out what, what I have that is yours and take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them, meaning didn't know she'd stolen the gods. Let's pick up in verse 33. So Laban went to Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. First and foremost, that lets us know how wealthy Jacob is. If each wife and, and all the servants have their own tents, that shows us that these people are incredibly wealthy because typically it was everybody in one large tent. And in this particular instance, everyone has their own tent, which shows you that they're a very, very prominent family. I worked concert production for years, and one time I worked with the band Def Leppard, and uh, I was curious as to why there were only five members of the band, but there were like 11 tour buses, and that's because every member of Def Leppard has their own bus. So it shows you they're a very prominent act, right? There's a lot of money there, and there's a lot of money here. Everybody's got their own tent, so that shows you how wealthy they are. Verse 34, now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. So she's in her tent. She has put all of these household idols in her saddle and is sitting on the saddle, right? Uh, let's see here. Still there, verse 34. Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she, that's Rachel, said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of the woman is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. One question would be, if he's searching all around, but she's sitting on these idols in the saddle, why doesn't he ask her to get up? And the details right there, uh, she says, I cannot rise before you, for the way of the way of women is upon me. She is currently experiencing her monthly period. Period. And the reason he does not ask her to get up is because it was extremely taboo uh, to um, be disrespectful to a woman on her period. So when a woman was experiencing her monthly cycle, they they were they were respected in that society. Um, 
So he's not going to move her. He's not going to disrespect her, ask her to move in any way. He's going to search around but not have her get up because of that. Very taboo to um, be disrespectful to a woman during that time. So he doesn't find the, the household gods. Laban doesn't. But Jacob is upset that his father-in-law is going about searching all of these things. And, and I, don't, I don't think he's ransacking anything, but he's clearly going place to place searching through your stuff. And you know how it is. If someone's looking through your personal belongings, that's, that can really make you upset, right? Especially since he's being extremely, uh, he's, he's accusing people very, very harshly of, of taking these. So Jacob is going to stand up for his family and for his wives here in verse 36 says, then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you've hotly pursued me? So my Bible says, what is my offense? Your Bible may say, what is my trespass? Trespass, I think, is probably the better word there because these two words, trespass and sin, are related to one another. The word trespass refers to overstepping a boundary, doing something you should not do. Sin is actually a word that means missing the mark. So when we talk about sinning, we have missed the mark, right? We've done something that breaks the heart of God, and so we've missed the mark. It, it, sin is an archery term. When you're shooting a bow and arrow and you miss the bullseye or you miss your target, the word for that is sin. So in ancient ar archery competitions, uh, they would have these, they would have cards, right? or signs, or whatever, and uh, if you aimed at your target and missed, it was sin, right, so sin means missing the mark, so when we sin, that means we have missed the mark that God has established for us, so side note on sin, we haven't really described it in that fashion before, but so there you go, so he says, what, what, how have I overstepped, how have I missed the mark that you have pursued me so hotly, because remember, Laban chased after him for seven days, Right, I mean, that, that's a pretty hot pursuit. Uh, verse 37, Jacob's still speaking. For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. Laban has been embarrassed in front of his family. He has followed Jacob for seven days. He has accused them of stealing from him. And according to Laban, they haven't found anything. So now he's embarrassed in front of his family. And so that's kind of now got to be taken care of. Verse 38, these 20 years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried and I've not eaten the rams of your flock. So Jacob spent actually 20 years with Laban, 14 for each wife, or, or for, seven for each wife, so 14 years. Then he spent an extra six years as a master shepherd for Laban's flock. So 20 years of his life he spent with him. And Jacob is talking about his superior shepherding skills. None of your flocks have miscarried. They've actually grown. They've been well taken care of. Uh, I've not eaten anything of your rams. Look at verse 39. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. He says, if you lost a sheep to a wild animal, I covered the loss. The reason that Jacob covers the loss is so that uh, Laban cannot accuse him of mismanagement. Right, so Jacob's going to cover the loss himself, A, because he's able to do so, and B, so that the owner doesn't accuse him of mishandling things. Jacob's just talking about uh, why would I have a reason to steal for, from you? I've, I've done all these things. Check this out. Uh, verse 40. There I was. By day the heat consumed me and the cold by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. In the Middle East, it's insanely hot. That may be a, a very obvious statement, but I lived there for two months and I will tell you that it is no small thing to be in triple digits during the day. We actually, when we were digging on the, on the archaeological site, uh, we could only dig until noon. We would start digging at 5 a.m. and we would end at noon because it was way too hot to be out there even at noon. So, uh, and at night, it's the exact opposite. It gets very, very, very cold. So Jacob is describing, I put myself out there in the sweltering heat, didn't have a lot of sleep, in the blistering cold to take care of your stuff and I covered all the losses and your flock prospered. Why would I have a reason to steal from you? Verse 41, these 20 years I've been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. We just talked about that. 
and you have changed my wages 10 times. So remember back when we talked about Jacob taking the striped and the spotted and the speckled and the black animals? As, the, as God increased those animals, Laban saw them increasing and he would change them. Well, now only the spotted are your wages. Well, now only the speckled are your wages. He changed it 10 times. So Laban is, is, is a flighty individual. Uh, verse 42, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So remember, Jacob is the recipient of the covenant promises. He is well aware that it is God who has prospered him. And if it had not been for God, right, he, uh, he would have had absolutely nothing. He has nothing apart what, from what God has given him. But uh, this is a really interesting uh, thing here in verse 42. It says, The God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac. In that verse, you'll notice fear is capitalized. One of the names for, for God they're using for God in this instance is the fear of Isaac. What he meant was, Isaac, my father, feared the Lord. And that's a crucial aspect that we have got to adapt, adopt as well. We must be God-fearers. Right? We, we must fear the Lord. Now, when we talk about fearing the Lord, we're not talking about you need to cower under your desk and you need to be afraid of him because he's a tyrant. That's not it at all. When it talks about Isaac, this capital word fear here, when it talks about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about a reverential awe. Okay, so having this this reverence for God, because not only is he the all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent, sovereign God of the universe, um, he is a loving father. And so we are in all of his power. We are in all of his authority. And in that, we are fearing. We, we fear God as we would fear a parent, right? There's a there's an extreme love for them, but there's a reverence for their authority. And that's what that's the case here. We must be fearers of the Lord, right? Because you're taking his authority seriously and uh, you're understanding his incredible power and that he wants what's best for you. All throughout scripture, it talks about the fear of the Lord. You know, in Proverbs, it talks about the, 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 the fear of the Lord as it pertains to wisdom. I think it says it's, it's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, here it talks about, you know, Isaac having this incredible reverence for him. Um, I, in my personal um in my personal Bible study, I'm reading through the book of Ecclesiastes right now, and it talks about the importance of the fear of the Lord. You know what? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes 8. I was reading this this morning, and it fits perfectly with what we're talking about. <clears throat> Here in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is a really interesting book. Uh, I'll have to give you more background on it at some point, but uh, Ecclesiastes here, uh, the 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 preacher who is who is speaking these words here, um, says this. Let's read Ecclesiastes eight, beginning in verse ten. Feel free to pause the video to get there. Ecclesiastes eight, starting in verse ten. This is the the preacher or the teacher speaking. He says this. Then I saw the wicked buried. They, they used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because of the sentence against an evil, uh, because the sentence against an evil deed is not ex executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. And here it is, verse 12. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. So fearing the Lord is the absolute beginning of wisdom if that is where that's the relationship we have with him we're not scared of him but we fear him and have this awe and reverence that's the fear of isaac here A another verse i'd like for us to look at is psalm 119 120 so turn with me to psalm 119 Psalm 119, verse 120. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's 176 verses long. So we're going to look here. Psalm 119, 120. This coffee brought to you by KCU. Psalm 119, 120. The author says this. 
My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgment. So there is a hint of fear of God's judgment. We know his wrath. We know that no sin goes unpunished. But we also know his incredible love and grace. And the combination of those two equals a fear of the Lord that can only be described as awe and reverence. So let's go back to Genesis. I wanted to take a time to look at that because fearing the Lord is not something people talk about anymore, and that's a shame. But uh, we must be God-fearers. That's why uh, it, when we're doing our current Sunday series through Acts. You will hear some people, particularly Gentiles, described as God-fearers. That means they respect and have awe for the God that we worship. Um, verse 43, we're jumping back in. So that was Jacob speaking to Laban. Now we're going to get Laban speaking to Jacob. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, and the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and that all you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters and for their children whom they have borne? He's talking about his grandchildren. Uh, family units at this point and clan units are very, very tight. So Laban sees Jacob's grandchildren as his family as well. And I know that sounds obvious, but uh, he's, when he talks about children he's talking about his actually his grandchildren but family units were so tight their even extended family is seen as a cohesive unit uh verse 44 uh come now let us make a covenant you and i talking to jacob jacob let's make a covenant uh, and let it be a witness between you and me. So this covenant that they're talking about is not necessarily the same covenant that God would make with humans. So when we talk about um, covenants between God and man, we are talking about solemn uh agreements, almost like a marriage, right? A covenant is more than just, just a handshake agreement, just a head nod or sign on paper. It requires a... Um, a promise from God, right, and a commitment from humans. That, that's what a covenant requires. And so, uh, and, it, and it's very, very heavily binding, right? In this instance, verse 44, we get something called a parody covenant. Not parody like song parody, parody covenant, which is actually an agreement between two equals, okay? When God makes a covenant with humans, those are not equals, right? God is far above us, right? He tells us in Isaiah, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He is superior in every way to us. A parody covenant is an agreement between two equals. So this is this is a more solemn contractual agreement. So they are going to make a, a agreement here to not do harm to each other, as we will see. Verse 45, so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar, and Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap and ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha. Boy, that's a mouthful. Jagar Sahadutha. So that's actually not Hebrew. That's Aramaic, okay, which is another language. That's actually the language that Jesus spoke. He spoke Aramaic. And that phrase, Jehar Sahadutha, means heap of witness. So they are making a stone pillar and a heap of rocks, and those two elements are going to serve as a witness to this agreement. So now anytime they see the pillar and the heap of stones, anytime anyone sees the pillar or the heap of stones, that will remind them of the covenant agreement. But Jacob called it Galid. Galid is Hebrew for heap of witness. So uh, Jehar Sahadutha, is Aramaic, and Galid is Hebrew, but they both mean heap of witness. Uh, let's see here. Verse 48, Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he, Laban, named it Galid and Mitzpah, for he said, The Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. So Mitzpah means watch post, um, and it also sounds like Right, just the Hebrew word for watch, which is mitzpah, the same thing. So again, we get a play on words, but mitzpah actually means watch post or outward looking. Right? Uh, so essentially, God is serving, not only are these two things serving as a witness, but God himself, as he looks down from heaven, is serving as a witness here. So this is a pretty solemn agreement. It's not the same as a covenant between God and man, but God is serving as the witness here. So that's, that lets us know how seriously they're taking these things. 
uh, let's see, verse 50. If you oppress my daughters or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. So this here's a lesson for us. When you make a promise, right, especially a promise to God, you had better keep it. That's the lesson, right? There's really no other commentary I can make on that. When you make a promise, you had better keep it. Verse 51. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and the pillar which I've set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I'm not, I will not pass over this heap to you and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. So it's not like they're creating a boundary. This is my side, this is your side, and let's never cross. The agreement is this pillar and this heap is a witness that we will never cross this boundary to do harm to one another. They can still interact with one another, but we will never cross this line to, to do one another any, any harm. Jacob set up a pillar back in chapter 28 as well. Um, he set up the pillar uh, at Bethel to as a memorial of the time God had spoken to him to give him the covenant promises. So we've seen Jacob set up a pillar before. He's doing the same thing here. Verse 53. Laban's still speaking, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So that lets us know that even Abraham's father worshiped the same God. It did not start with Abraham, uh, the worship of God. It started even with Abraham's father. That's what we're learning here. Uh, so Jacob swore by the fear of his father. We just talked about that. By the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. Uh, Jacob offering a sacrifice. That is the only time recorded in the book of Genesis we read about Jacob participating in sacrificial worship. Jacob worships. Oh, he does. But there's a difference in like calling on the name of the Lord in worship and offering a sacrifice in worship like Abraham did in Genesis 22 or back in chapter 12. Um, this is the only time in the whole book of Genesis Jacob engages in sacrificial worship. Um, verse 55, early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. So this conflict has now been resolved. There's an agreement between Jacob and Laban and God is serving as a witness to these things. The pillar and the heap are serving as a reminder of these things that they're not going to do each other harm again or they're not going to do each other harm at all. The conflict is resolved. Laban goes back home with his kinsmen that he brought with him. And from this point on, uh, Jacob is now going to move on and uh, establish his family wherever, uh, wherever they decide to live. Um, next chapter, we're going to talk about some really interesting things. Jacob is actually going to wrestle physically with God. That's going to be a pretty deep conversation. We'll have some fun with that. Uh, and we'll, we'll jump into 32. You can hear Stanley amening everything we just talked about up there. Um, if you have prayer requests or questions, my email is in the call, is in the uh, description to this video. Make sure that you uh, send those to me. Two services on Sunday, uh, continuing our series through Acts. Uh, thank you guys for your time this evening. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We are so thankful uh, that uh, you are so loving and gracious. I pray, Lord, we are always keeping our promises to you as you always keep your promises to us. Lord, I pray that we are fearing you, having this awe and reverence for you because of who you are. We pray over these prayer requests that are on our hearts this evening, Lord. We love you. We thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.